So this is my short keynote on what we call the Catholic Counter-Reformation. And this is the last part of our Chapter 17 material in Unit 3. So keep in mind that in Unit 3, we have uh, three chapters. And one of them is Chapter 17, and then Chapter 19 and Chapter 20. And this Catholic Counter-Reformation is the last part of Chapter 17. Uh, it's, in, it's in chapter 17, section 4. So here we go. Uh, the Catholic Counter-Reformation uh, is essentially what you see there, the Council of Trent. And you might remember from religion class talking about the Council of Trent um, in uh, freshman religion. Uh, Trent is a town in northern Italy. It's uh, in uh, upper, it's, it, it's actually a, a, in the mountainous area of northeast Italy on the border with Switzerland. And, uh, and it's called Trenta, Trenta, okay? So the Council of Trenta met uh, for over 20 years in the mid-16th century, basically 1545 to 16, uh, 1545 to 1565, um, okay? So for about 20 years, it was a series of meetings and councils um, that was composed of the Catholic Church hierarchy, uh, bishops, cardinals, theologians, and so forth. And their purpose was to address the Protestant charges, okay? So all of the things that the Protestants had been uh, uh, charging the Catholic Church with, you know, like corruption uh, uh, and uh, the uh, simony and nepotism and all these things that the Protestants were charging the Catholics uh, with doing, the Catholic Church met in order to address these charges, okay? Okay. Um, so basically, for instance, the Protestants were opposed to the Catholic Church's practice of selling indulgences. So one of the things that the Council of Trent uh, addressed was the sale of indulgences. Okay, So everything that the Protestants were charging the Church with, or everything that was happening in Protestant Europe um, in the 16th century, was uh, uh, addressed and taken up as an issue at the Council of Trenta. Let's go to our next slide. So, in the end, what did the Council of Trent accomplish? Well, um, I s mentioned how the Council met in order to address the charges that the Protestant churches were bringing against um, the Catholic Church. So, basically, um, a, a good way to think of it is anything, anything that um, the Catholic Church <laughs> Uh, was being charged with, uh, like the sale of indulgences and the veneration of relics and the um, obedience to the papacy, uh, well, uh, the Council of Trent simply reaffirmed or restated the importance of these things. So if Protestants uh, are critical of um, the uh, Catholic Church and its practice of uh, confessing sins to a priest, well, guess what? The, at the Council of Trent, um, the sacraments, especially confession, were reaffirmed. Okay, so um, some of the things that the Council of Trent accomplished are here on this slide. One, uh, the Council of Trent reasserted the role and importance of the papacy and the authority of the Pope. Uh, two, uh, the Catholic Church uh, affirmed the uh, legitimacy of indulgences and uh, encouraged the continuation of the faithful uh, to uh, buy indulgences. Uh, the Council of Trent reaffirmed the intercession of saints. Uh, I mentioned how the Council of Trent reaffirmed the uh, practice of the sacraments, especially confession. Um, they also uh, uh, emphasized uh, the uh, uh, good pr practice of veneration of relics. And um, a vener when you venerate something, you honor it. When you, when you are venerating something, you are honoring it, you are giving it importance, and so forth. So a relic is uh, like the Shroud of Turin. I don't know if you've heard of the Shroud of Turin, but, you know, or maybe you've heard of the uh, Holy Grail, you know, the cup that, uh, that Christ used at the Last Supper. They call it the Holy Grail. Um, a relic is uh, something very old, and it's usually connected with 
somebody very uh, holy, like a saint, or in some cases, Christ himself. So, for instance, um, pieces of the true cross, or like I said, the Shroud of Turin is supposedly the burial cloth of, of Jesus after he was taken down from the cross. So the veneration of relics was a very uh, common thing in the 16th century in Western Europe, um, especially by Catholics, but the Protestants rejected all of that because they felt that when you are venerating a relic, you're misplacing your faith. It's almost like idolatry. You know, instead of, um, instead of believing and worshiping God alone, you're putting your faith in like an object. So anyway, the Council of Trent reaffirmed all of these things and basically uh, upheld every Catholic practice. But two things that um, uh, were in response to uh, the Protestants' uh, uh, criticisms were, one, um, the Council of Trent uh, acknowledged the importance of Scripture in the creation and sustaining of church doctrine. In other words, um, the Council of Trent recognized that it needed to. The, the, the Council of Trent recognized that the Catholic Church had to get back to the Bible. It had to get back to a good scriptural foundation. So that was one thing. And uh, the Council of Trent encouraged and created um, <clears throat> religious orders of men and women in the Catholic Church uh, that were dedicated to education and charitable work among the poor. And I listed three of them here. Uh, you've probably heard of the Jesuits. For instance, uh, the Jesuits are the priests who operate Loyola High School and uh, uh, Loyola Marymount University, as well as Georgetown and um, Seattle University and so forth. Okay, Gonzaga and all those. They're, they're known for higher education work. Um, also, the Ursuline Sisters, okay, and they are dedicated to uh, working among the poor. Uh, in fact, they're still they're still around, as are uh, also the Salesians. The Salesians have uh, a number of hospitals, and they also work in um, uh, among the poor. And so the Salesians are also known uh, and education as well. But uh, these religious orders were a way of the Catholic Church to reconnect with um, the faithful people, the laity uh, of Europe, uh, following the uh, Counter Reformation. Um, once you finish watching this slide, go ahead. Once you finish watching this slideshow, um, uh, take a pause, go over your notes from this one, and then I'd like you to watch my slideshow on Mannerist and Baroque art.